Hello, everyone, and welcome to Score Fairfield County's live webinar on Launch Your Own Forgettable Brand. I'm Bob Hogan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at Score Fairfield County. I'm going to be your host today, and our presenter is Ramon Peralta. More, more on Ramon in just a minute. Um, this webinar is being done in collaboration with the Monroe Chamber of Commerce and the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. In that regard, I'd like to invite Beth Stoller from the Monroe Chamber to also give some brief introductory remarks. Beth? I think you're, you're muted. Beth, can you unmute? Okay, well, maybe we'll come back to Beth in a minute. Um, I will um, just give some brief information on uh, SCORE. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please, Ramon. Um, SCORE is a nonprofit national partner of the SBA, and locally here in SCORE Fairfield County, we have about 100 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. And we offer three primary services that you can see on the screen there. We offer one-on-one -on -one business mentoring, and you can access that using the yellow bit.ly link or you can go to our website and click on request a mentor. Secondly, we offer business education programs about hundred throughout the year, uh, like this one. We offer now in-person workshops and both online webinars, and you can access those also on demand by going to our website at fairfieldcounty.score.org. And lastly, on our website, we offer a wide range of extensive resources, including business tools and information. Our next workshop is in person at the Norwalk Library on Wednesday, November 30th at 6 p.m. And the topic is access to capital with a wide range of panel experts covering capital sources available to small businesses. And again, you can find more specifics on our website. I think I now see uh, that Beth is unmuted. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Beth to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Monroe Chamber before I uh, introduce Ramon. Beth? Thank you, Bob. You hear me now? We can. Oh, wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Beth Stoller, and I'm operations and event manager for the Monroe Chamber. On behalf of the Chamber, the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library, and SCORE, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's Lunch and Learn. It's been nearly five years that we three organizations have worked together to bring you great business topics and help you learn and grow as business professionals. Before I speak about today's event, I wanna ask you to mark your calendars because the three organizations are coming together again on Wednesday, December 14th. We're delighted to welcome back one of our favorite speakers, Cliff Anico, who's gonna be speaking about selling on Amazon, eBay, and Etsy, how to improve your business results. So hold Wednesday, December 14th at noon for another Lunch and Learn, our last one for 2022. We're also starting to work on our 2023 calendar. We will have nine webinars, nine lunch and learn that we're gonna be introducing. January, February, and March will be webinars. And come April, we're gonna start meeting back in person at the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. So we will keep you up to date with what's going on. You will hear information from us. And now I wanna bring you back to another one of our favorite speakers and Bob today. I can't wait to hear from Ramon because we all need to learn as much as we can about branding and how it impacts our business. So thank you everybody for attending. We wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving and I'm turning the microphone back over to you, Bob, and to Ramon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Beth. Uh, before I introduce uh, Ramon, just a couple of logistics about uh, today. We have set aside time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question, you can type it in at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your presentation, and Ramon will take them after his prepared remarks. Uh, we will end our webinar sharply at one o'clock to respect your time. The session is being recorded and recording is avail available on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org under on-demand webinars in the next day or so. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ramon Peralta. Ramon is a social entrepreneur, TED speaker, and author of Launch Your Own Brand, the fastest way to supercharge any business. He's also the founder and creative director at Peralta Design, an award-winning mission-driven digital market agency headquartered in Shelton, Connecticut. I'll now turn it over to Ramon. Ramon. All right. Thank you, Bob. 
So we're going to get right right into this. And I'm just going to start with my story, which is a great uh, kind of segue into one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give all the listeners out there. And that is that, you know, one great way to differentiate your brand is to tell your story. And a little bit about my background. Um, I was on the team that started Priceline.com um, back in 1998. And really earned, you know, my stripes there in launching brands, working alongside Jay Walker uh, for 10 years after the launch of Priceline. We continued to pursue trying to catch lightning in a bottle twice. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until the big crash or big uh, known as the Great Recession of 2008 um, that I was laid off along with um, everyone else and had to do some serious soul searching. Um, so I empathize with the small business owner. You can call me a reluctant entrepreneur because it was never really my dream to start my own company. I just found myself in a position where I couldn't uh, find a job. And I, and I decided to take my severance and create a mission-driven business whose goal was primarily to help other people launch their businesses. And I found myself with a lot of colleagues that were in a similar position and felt that there was a great need for it. Um, today, um, our team uh, is, is, is based in, um, in Shelton, Connecticut. And I want to also let everybody know here that your, your, your strong work ethic and your entrepreneurial spirit are really going to drive you to success. We all have what it takes. And I implore all of you as we dive deeper into this workshop to think about what shapes you, what makes you unique and what in your journey has made you stronger. Um, and, and for me, uh, you know, I'm very, very grateful that today um, what seemed like was the worst thing that had happened to me is now become the best thing that has happened to me. And I'm able to service a, a wide array of clients over 30 states. I'm able to develop and mentor a, a, a great team here at PD. And, and today we're going to share some of the tactics that, that I've learned over the years uh, that I believe will help you stand out uh, in your business. Now, my goal today is going to be to go for about 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, and then give ample time for Q&A. I want to make sure I cover all the pieces that are important to you and where you are in your entrepreneurial journey. Um, so when I speak of preparing for takeoff or launching your unforgettable brand, I utilize this rocket metaphor. And I want you to think of your business as a rocket ship that needs to fly. They were trying to get it off the ground. The first thing that people see or the top of the rocket here is the branding. People often see your logo first or they hear your story or they see a slogan or they recognize your color. You know, I like to wear my logo. We'll talk about good brand identity and how important it is to debrand some of your branding, if you will. Um, the body of the ship, the hull of the ship, right? The cargo is your website, is your digital footprint. Have you Googled yourself? or your business lately to see what is showing up because that is how people are coming to learn about you through their phones and their tablets. And then the digital marketing is what we consider to be the engine of your company. The digital marketing, once you've established your branding and you've established your website, think of digital marketing as how are you driving awareness? How are you driving customers into your funnel? How are you um, kind of launching your brand higher and higher above the competition. Otherwise, you blend into the background. You, you know, it's called failure to launch. So we're going to talk about those three aspects, but I want you to, to, to kind of see how they really, really come together here. So brand strategy attracts your target customers. Primarily, that's what we're talking about here. And Let's get one thing straight. Branding is not just a logo. I've been in many networking groups where somebody stands up and they say, well, what do you do? And they say, well, uh, I do branding. Well, what does that mean? Well, I, I can put your logo on a keychain. We're going to talk about a lot more than that, right? I want you to see that there's so much more below the iceberg. I use this metaphor of the brand iceberg because it really clearly shows you that there's so much below the surface, so much work you should be doing as a business owner or as an entrepreneur, and I don't care if you're working from home or you have a big company, you have to make sure you, you're spending time thinking about what makes you different, what customer experiences are you providing, what's the company culture, 
we're seeing company culture a lot in the news right now with what's happening with Elon coming in and taking over Twitter and the change in culture that's forcing people to flee. You know, they're abandoning ship because they want no part of it. Um, your emotional values, your vision statement, your mission statement, right? How can people make decisions when you're not there? As you evolve in your business, you're going to find that your job is going to be to make yourself less and less important at your business. And you do that by establishing what your company values are, what things matter, and it'll help people communicate better. Before you take off in anything, in a plane, in a ship, what have you, there's always a checklist, right? Even in your car, you, you adjust your mirrors and you check your seatbelt. Well, these are things that you need to do before you launch your brand. Define your overall business strategy. Identify your target. Create your brand story. And I'm going to give you a cheat sheet on doing that. Um, research is so important. We're going to go deeper into that as well. Um, your name and your content marketing strategy, developing your website, building your toolkit, and then of course, implementing, analyzing, right? You're always in constant beta. That's a term we used in the, in the, in the dot-com space. Startups use that term a lot. And what that means is that you're constantly improving. You're building your ship as you fly. And I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs fail to launch because they want to get everything perfect. It's more important that you get your business out there than it is that you get it perfect. Because your clients, if you're paying attention, are going to give you a lot of insight that you're going to want to make changes in your business model. So you're building your ship as you fly. But you've got to look at the data and you've got to listen to your clients. Now, let's start with brand story. Here's a quick kind of cheat sheet for this and, and, and something that we use internally is you want to take a notepad and write down everything. We really are strong believers in manifesting and visualizing and picturing where you see your business going. So take everything and write it down, your past, present, and future. Why did you start the business to start with? And I'm going to give you some examples of, of why some other folks started their businesses. I shared with you why I started mine and how. And it still drives our mission to this day. We still volunteer for SCORE because it aligns with our mission to help others launch their brands. Take that and turn, take that number one and turn it into a brand manifesto. Sum up why the company exists. Why are you here? How are you making the world a better place? Why are you different? And you take that number two and you write your brand story off of that, right? And be true, be authentic, be honest be human. If you're a personal brand, if anyone on the call is a realtor or a speaker or a coach and doesn't really plan on, say, get becoming huge and having all these employees, but is more of a, you're trying to build more of a personal brand. And realtors are a good example because before they open up their own real estate agency, they often go from one brand to another. They might be Keller Williams this week and William Ravis the next week, but they build a following. They build a reputation. So your brand story for a personal brand, think of it as a journey that you're taking the audience through. The hero, you, goes through some kind of tense situation because they believe they have some higher purpose and they push through those challenges. And eventually they resolve or solve a problem that benefits their target audience. And the best brand stories are relatable, right? Because we've all struggled with challenges. We all have beliefs and we all have highlights that may occur during that journey. For a business or organization, you don't have to overthink this. I use Warby Parker as an example because their problem that they aim to solve was very, very simple. Glasses are too expensive. That's it. And it all comes down to remembering why you started the brand and how it can help or serve others. So they're still one of the main, largest, biggest, most well-known online retailers of, of eyeglasses. And, and their idea for starting, their why was very simple. They just wanted to create affordable options for glasses. Um, Insomnia Cookies is a great example of, of a brand story that's very simple. Um, they're located all around the country. They, they have one uh, location in New Haven on Yale's campus. Um, they're a differentiator. They deliver, cook, deliver cookies well into the night until three in the morning. Um, but you can see in their brand story that they're very true to their original mission. They were founded in a college dorm, the University of Pennsylvania, by a student 
who, uh, you know, and they've, been, and they've been feeding that insatiable hunger of their fans ever since. So they're humorous and funny and light. And you can tell in their branding, which, which we'll go into a little bit deeper, how that all ties in. Um, another one is Taft. Very, very simple story. If you spend any time on social media, I'm sure you've seen their ads. They, they spend heavily on social. But they tell you in their brand story, they were married in 2011. They have three kids. They stay up late. They, they like talking about shoes. They think their kids are cool. And they founded it out of a tiny two-bedroom apartment. It's very relatable. And their vision remains the same. They believe in making beautifully unique shoes and offering the best service and value possible. And offering the best service often comes down to some pain point, all right? Think about your industry. What do people hate about it? How can you address those issues in your branding to make people aware of the fact that not only are you different, but that the experience is going to be better than what they've had before? Choose Love is one of our favorite clients. They're a nonprofit, um, and their brand story, you know, is so moving, um, you know, Scarlett Lewis founded Choose Love uh, after losing her son in Sandy Hook. He was only six years old. Uh, he perished. They found him draped over uh, his teacher, Vicky Soto, who they've named the 5K after. And, and Scarlett found three words that he had written on a chalkboard in her home. You know, it was like nurturing and compassion and love. And she just saw it as something from the beyond that was telling her, like, I've got to create something in his honor. And she's developed a curriculum, right, that is now available at no cost to schools and prison systems throughout the country. It's a conflict resolution platform. So how compelling is that? How great of a brand story is that when you're thinking about which nonprofits to support? It really, really hits home. Um, with something like that of that magnitude. Now, when I talk about brand thoughts, I, I often um, utilize golf as a metaphor because I'm a big golfer. I try to play. I've been playing for many years. But anyone that has ever tried the sport knows that if you go out to play and you have too many thoughts in your head of what you should do with your swing, you know, keep your legs bent and your back straight and your left arm straight and your head down, you know, and turn your hips and follow through. It's like if you, you good luck trying to hit the ball. Right. So brand thoughts are very similar. Entrepreneurs make the mistake in their pitches oftentimes about telling everything they do in the kitchen sink. And guess what? It's not repeatable. That's why ours is very simple. We launch brands or we help businesses launch new products or services in the digital space through brand, web, and digital marketing strategies. It's very simple. What do you offer? How will it make my life better? What do I need to do to buy it? Those three things should be coming clearly through your collateral and your website. Now that you've got your brand story down and your brand thoughts down, now we move on to this phase of brand naming. And some of you already say, hey, Ramon, I've already got a name for my company. And so did I. I started my company technically while I was still in college. I didn't know much about branding so back then. So the name of my company was Peralta Illustration and Design LLC. Right? It was super long, a mouthful. Now, today, we're a DBA known as Peralta Design. Okay, So you can have a DBA associated with your legal name that may have a keyword in it so that it's more uh, search friendly and shorter, easier to remember and repeatable, right? So naming is very a very challenging aspect of starting your own business and launching your own brand. But oftentimes when we're developing strategy around that, it's based off whether or not that URL is available, all right? Um, does anyone else own it? You know, maybe you might make up a word, but if you do make up a word or use a compound word, utilizing keywords is a great strategy for relevancy online. And that's another key way to help launch your brand. So you've got your brand story. You've got your name. Now you're ready to move on to the most fun part, I think, which is developing your brand identity. Think about these things as you're developing your mark. Is it, you know, it, is, is it going to attract your target demographic? Will it reproduce well? Um, what are the corporate colors? There's a real psychology behind color, 
If it's food related, using the food colors are important or warm earth tones. It gets people hungry. It gets people thinking. Um, if you're in the finance space, you may want to use um, colors such as blue or green because they evoke trust. Um, for us, we're in a very crowded competitive space. So we utilize red quite a bit because it stands out amongst the competition and, it's, and it represents energy. So colors are very important. Think about how those colors and those design elements can migrate over into some of your other collateral so that you can really start building a cohesive brand. You see here how their branding translates over into the food, into the packaging, into, into swag and attire, into banners, tablecloths. You know, it's helped her go from being in farmer's markets to being in stores. This was a, a brand identity we developed for a client in Trumbull. Um, it's, a, it's a new coffee shop slash bookstore that's run by special needs students. And it's in the White, um, um, White Plains Road you know, shopping center there, Trumbull Center. So check it out. Um, and I love this identity, um, not just because we did it, <laughs> but because there is a symbol that goes with it. There's an icon that goes with it. And it's a coffee mug that kind of looks like a book at the same time. So try to create a visual language without using too many characters or too many words. And you're seeing, um, you know, and this is an example of insomnia cookies where they took a bite out of their cookie and it looks like the moon, right? So try to be clever in your branding and try to be simple in it as well. And you see how the branding of insomnia cookies kind of carries over into their packaging and into their digital footprint. It's all about consistency. Now. Bobby Taylor Painting is a good example of a, of a dated brand that was created uh, pre-internet. This is from the 80s. And so we needed to kind of modernize them. They had no real following. So evolution wasn't as important, meaning that we didn't have to like migrate them from one brand to the other um, because their customers were B2B. These guys were doing commercial painting for gyms and hospitals and universities. And so we had the luxury of starting over and we created a brand for them that also had this icon. And you can see how icons work well on mugs and, and that kind of thing. And I'll just share ours here in the video, how you can see Peralta Design is also just a PD. So great strategy. If you have a logo already and you don't have an icon for it, highly recommend you do that. And we're seeing a trend towards debranding, right? You're seeing, a, this is Willis Tower Watson and um, WTW uh, is not WTW and Pricewaterhouse Cooper is now uh, PWC, right? So less real estate on phones, shorter retention spans, competing against a lot of noise. How can you take your brand and debrand it and simplify it into an icon that's still recognizable um, to your constituents. So you've got the brand story, you've, you've, you've established your name, you've got your logo, now you're moving on to the website. And I would uh, remind all attendees that you're, um, you qualify for a free website report card from us. I would just put score somewhere in the memo section. But if you go to our website, ProfitDesign.com, you can apply for this and we will grade your website based on these following metrics. The UI is super important. That's the user interface. What do people see when they go to your website? And what is the experience? User experience is really clutch because if it's not clear what you want me to do, most people leave. Speaking of leaving, performance is super important. Google has statistics that if your website is not loading, Within three to five seconds, 80% of people are not going to come back to visit, right? So it's very important. And that performance hindrance could be something as simple as a picture that's too large, that's not loading, or some other, uh, maybe an, an expired SSL certificate is, is giving a warning message. So these are things to pay attention. Uh, SEO, organic and paid is super important. We recommend that you have at least 300 words per page on your website so that the, the, the search engines will not ignore your website. And if it's not mobile friendly, meaning it doesn't work well on phones or it's not responsive, it's not going to get picked up by web crawlers. And that's also going to be a big disadvantage to you. 
and make sure that your content is rich with keywords and SEO. And often a great way to do that is to utilize case studies or list out your services or use some customer testimonials because it allows you to utilize keywords, you know, search terms that people may have for your industry or business in the body of your website and it makes for better organic search engine optimization. Above the fold, let's talk a little bit about that. This is an example of Bobby Taylor Painting's website and I want you to see a couple of things here. Number one, this is what you'd see without scrolling. And the, the term above the fold comes from newspapers, the boxes that we used to sell newspapers in the corner. For those of you old enough to remember, you only saw the top half of the newspaper and it was supposed to be compelling enough that it made you want to buy it. It could be a really good headline. It could be a, a really good photo. So make sure that what's above the fold on your current website is compelling. And more importantly, has the calls to action. What do you want people to do? Because you've probably spent money to get them here, either through, through Google ad or, or posting on social media or wearing a t-shirt, or you got it on your truck, or whatever it might be, but now they're here, what do you want them to do? And according to a software that we utilize called Hotjar, it's pretty much common practice that the, the, the path that people take is from the upper left corner, across the screen to the top right corner, diagonally across the screen to the lower left, and then back right to the lower right, and then they finish in the middle of the page. And so all of your most important calls to action should be in those locations. And with Bobby Taylor Painting, one of their pain points that they were addressing was they wanted to make sure that a human being was answering the phone. So their calls to action in both locations are call us now. If you're a solopreneur, that call to action for you might be get a free estimate, um, contact us. It may not be practical for you to answer the phone, but there should be something clear that you want people to do when they visit. So you've got a good website up, you've got your brand, you've got your story. Let's move on to now the engine, driving traffic, raising awareness, and that's marketing strategy. So from, from a marketing standpoint, your number one thing to do before you spend any money is understand your audience. Really get into what's trending in your industry, what's important to them, um, where are they hanging out at? If you're B2B, then you should be spending time advertising on LinkedIn. If you're a consumer brand, TikTok might be the best place for you to be as well. You don't need to be everywhere. That can be very overwhelming, but you've got to have an idea of who am I trying to reach. And oftentimes that can be done through really conducting some good research. And there's there are two types. The primary research is when you conduct it and you're actually holding focus groups or you're sending out a survey or you hire a marketing firm that's going to do that for you, but that can be expensive. Secondary research is you're, you're collecting data or looking at data that somebody else conducted a survey for. And this could be done by doing Google searches. It may not answer exactly the question you're looking for, but it will give you some insight, right, into who are you trying to reach. Once you're understanding this, you can create a proto persona or an avatar. It just gives you an idea, who am I trying to reach? Because that may drive what kind of visuals you're using in your marketing. It might, it might drive what kind of uh, verbiage or content. Is it really highbrow? Is it friendly? Is the tone uh, serious or academic, or is it exciting and fun, right? All of those clues will come from who am, I, who am I speaking to, right? So you can be very intentional in your marketing. This is a very important piece of this presentation here, and, and, I'll, and I'll highlight those slides when they come up, but this is what we call our marketing funnel. And you'll see variations on this from different marketing agencies, but overall, you want to get people through this funnel all the way down through conversion and retention. The awareness phase is when you're spending um, money or time with social ads on, on, on social platforms or video ads or promoting or boosting posts. You're getting people aware of what the problem is and what, what, your, what your company can do to solve it. 
So they're they're moving now from that awareness phase of like, oh, okay, I didn't know they did that. Let me check out their website. Now you got them in consideration phase. They're actually doing some research. They're clicking, they're looking, and this is an opportunity for remarketing or retargeting. And what that means, and we've all experienced it, if there's someone in your household under the same IP address and they're searching for lawnmowers or they're searching for you know a blazer or makeup you might log on and all of a sudden you're seeing ads for makeup or blazers or lawnmowers on your social media feed that's that's the process of retargeting or remarketing there are there are um pixels that you can put or or cookies that you know as they were called before where you can track people's activity online and you can give them a more targeted ad after they've been to your website and come back to social media. And that's what we call the consideration phase. And now in the conversion phase, they've explored all these options and they've clicked yours and they're ready to sign up for a newsletter or to get a free estimate or to make a purchase, right? Now they're in the conversion phase. You've moved them successfully down the funnel. Retention speaks to those clients that you already have that you continue to give value to by giving them more educational content and sales and insights and tips. And you're, you're, you're maintaining that relationship so that your brand stays top of mind with them, but you're not necessarily selling. Some common marketing goals that you may have are, are increasing web traffic, um, developing a content strategy, whether it's for brand awareness or retention, um, Generating sales, lead generation is a big a big goal that a lot of folks have, and we're going to dive into how you can actually do that. To give you a little bit more info on SEO, um, the better your website is on both the back and front end and the better traffic you get, the more search engines will increase your search ranking. So keyword analysis, backlink link building, and content creation is super important. And this is a good visual for you to understand the difference between paid search engine uh, you know, search engine optimization and search engine marketing. The, the SEM is what we call when you're paying per click. And when you, when you Google something, those ads that come up at the top and on the side are paid. The ones that you see in the blue section are free or organic, meaning that they're, you're showing up there because you have a really good website, not because you're paying. The best strategies are going to incorporate a little bit of both. So let's talk a little bit about social media. The best way to you to, to kind of get your, your strategy launched is to go through these seven steps. Research, determine which platform you want to be on. You don't have to be on all of them. This goes back to researching your clients and where do you think they are. Establishing your most important metrics. What is it that what is it that matters to you? Are you trying to get more subscribers? Are you trying to get more clients? Are you trying to get more email addresses? Get to know your competition. This is a great way for you to see what other folks are doing in your space. Get inspired. See what works. You know they they say don't don't um, don't create a contract that you wouldn't take yourself. Same thing goes for an ad. Don't create an ad that you wouldn't sign up for yourself. Right? And sometimes we need to see really good ads to get inspired. Um, create unique and engaging content. We're going to talk about what that golden ratio is uh, for content. Organize it's a schedule for your posts. Your posts don't have to um, be done manually. There's, there are a lot of software out there that you can utilize, uh, like Later or Hootsuite, that will get you kind of scheduled in advance. And I always stress this, analyze and optimize your results. These are examples of some display ads that you can use on social media for, for your business on Facebook or LinkedIn. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna have you focus on the one in the upper right that says lobbying. This was a lobbying firm client of ours out of New Haven. They didn't have a big database of email addresses and that they wanted to market to. So a lead magnet campaign is a great way for you to gather database, build your database. And what they did was they created an ebook of what lobbying is. A lot of people don't know what it is. In your industry, if you're, let's say you're uh, in home repair, you may say, here are the top 10 handy, handy tips uh, to keep your home 
you know, weatherproof during the winter, or if you're uh, a business coach, here are the top 10 uh, things that matter to, 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 you know, to great teams or developing trust at your organization or something of value, right? Give away something of value. And in exchange for that, people are going to voluntarily give you their email address, their name, their phone number. And guess what? They've now given you permission to market to them through an through a, a email marketing. And email marketing can be used for a number of things, building relationships, building your brand, promoting your content, marketing your products, so on and so forth. So think of something that you could give away of value that could be, com that could be converted into a PDF or an ebook and give that away. <clears throat> now, this is a big question for solopreneurs is what do I post? Because oftentimes I see uh, business owners that get on social or they get on, on LinkedIn and they don't know what to post other than promotional content. And the truth of the matter is people go on these platforms to either be educated or be entertained. They don't go on these platforms to be sold to. So 50% of your content should be informational. Answer questions that in your industry that, that maybe provide solutions to problems that people might be experiencing. Educate your audience. It also positions you as a subject matter expert. The other 30% should be entertainment, right? Understanding their interests, keep this type of content fun, show the visitors what, what it's like at your firm or what kind of things you do for fun or share a video that you thought was interesting that's relevant. And only 20%. 20% of your content should ever be promotional where you talk about your products and services. Unfortunately, most people do all of their content promotional and then guess what? People get sick of it and they unfollow. So I wanted to share with you, um, I know this looks complicated, but it's really not. I wanted to share with you this digital sales funnel. We had the marketing funnel, but this here is an illustration that shows you how you can take a piece of content such as this workshop, if I wanted to, and turn it into a funnel. Take this pillar content, if you will, take a 10 minute video of yourself, of your team, of a, of a workshop, of a seminar. And what you do now is you break that down into smaller bite-sized pieces of content. That same piece of pillar content can, can be extracted for audio, for a podcast, video for YouTube, it could go live on Facebook. Then you can have an editor cut it down even further to make shorter video clips of like three minutes or less and put that on your Facebook page, put that on your Instagram, put that on LinkedIn. Now here's the secret. If you see something that you post gets a lot of engagement and engagement means you're responding and communicating and being social, not just putting something up there and letting it and leaving it alone. But if you see something performs well, put some money behind it, boost it, put $20 behind it and expand your reach. And now you can retarget that audience and drive them to your website, capture their email addresses through some sort of a lead magnet or download, and then send them a monthly newsletter, right? So you can see how this all flowed from one end to another, from one large piece of content all the way to building up your database. This is an example of a business, and I want you, I know that many of you on this call are small businesses and can't afford a $25,000 video, but just think of a $2,500 video or even a $250 video, if you could find someone. In 2012, Poopuri had $8 million in revenue. In 2013, they wanted to make more money, so they invested in a video. They spent $25,000 on a video that went viral. They got over 10 million views in just two weeks. They, the company that makes a little pump at the top could not keep up with the demand. So their revenue went up because of that. Their revenue by 2014 went up to 27 million, just two years. And they've, they've gotten so big that now they just rebranded. They're just poor eat. So they've, their goal now is to eliminate all odors in cars and closets everywhere. So they become more of like a Febreze, if you will, that can be utilized for pets and all kinds of odors. So it's an amazing story of how a one piece of content, like that 20, if somebody told you, you can make, you know, $19 million in revenue from spending 25,000 on a video, who wouldn't do that? 
right? It's an amazing story of the power of content and going viral. So we're in the in the in the home stretch here, folks, and I thank you all for hanging in with me because it's a lot. Um, but now that you've got your branding established, you're ready for takeoff. You've got your name, your story, your logo, your website, your strategy. As individual brand marketers, meaning that you're going out there just as on your day to day, you're a brand ambassador for your business. I implore you all to just be a good human. Be a good human. When you're going to workshops, when you're speaking, when you're writing a pod, uh, an article, when you're, you know, at networking opportunities, right? This would be a great way for you to just focus on brand marketing. You're not marketing a particular service. You're just raising awareness on your brand. And why is that important? Howard Schultz said it best. If people believe they share values with a company, they, they will stay loyal to the brand. People buy an $8 cup of coffee because they love what Starbucks stands for, right? They're socially responsible. A socially responsible brand operates on a business model that focuses on social change. So I encourage all of you within your own brands and businesses, to, if you're not already doing it, to get involved with some movement or something that matters to you that can help your company stand out that's relevant to your business. So for example, at PD, we partner with Capital for Change and Connecticut Boost Fund and all the various incubators throughout the state because we're our mission is to help others launch their businesses. So we're going to be tapped into the most vulnerable in our communities, the most disadvantaged that need our services. We want to help them. We want to help them learn. So remember, more than 80% of millennial consumers expect the brands they support to take a stand on social issues. More than 52% of global consumers prefer to buy from brands that stand for something that will align with their personal values. Ben and Jerry's is very, very vocally anti-racist. This is a billboard that they put up um, in Tampa during the Super Bowl. And if, 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 if you haven't been to their website recently, check it out. They're really big on just social justice. That's, that's the cause that they've picked. Um, Patagonia is another one. Um, they're all about the environment. They sell outdoor clothes. They encourage people to go outside. So they're very passionate about climate change. And they actually sold this into their clothing. And every time these brands that I'm mentioning uh, take, have taken a stand on something that's important to them socially, their profits have gone through the roof, through the roof. What can you do locally? Um, I'll just be an example with what we do at PD is that we volunteer for a lot of charities in our community, whether it be Boys and Girls Club or planting community gardens with the United Way or volunteering for Team Inc. Um, we're currently collecting toys at our office for them or junior achievement. A number of things happen when you do this, right? Number one, you're doing something good. Number three, you're, you're building an army of brand ambassadors. You're also aligning your brand with these other nationally recognized brands. And you're letting people know that, hey, we're not just in here to secure the bag, but we're in here to make a difference. That's so critically important to you as you build your brand. So in conclusion of being a good human, remember that personal brands form real consumer loyalty, right? You want to be in alignment. Authentic brands, you do who you are, right? So be authentic because as you as your business becomes more successful, others may copy you. They may copy your pitch, your tagline, or your homepage, your logo, but they can't copy you. So I really want you to come through in your brand story and in those things that matter to you and your business so that your business is out here making a difference as a way to differentiate itself from the competition. By being authentically you, helping others and sharing knowledge. It's the fastest way for you to be your brand as you build your brand. Some books I recommend, Go Giver, Good to Great, Building a Story Brand. Building a Story Brand I love because it has an online curriculum. 
And the go-giver is all about giving away your expertise and helping others and how that comes back tenfold. And good to great, as you start scaling and, and hiring people, it, it will give you a lot of keen insights as to how you take your company from good to great. And it's often by not just having the, the right people on the bus, but making sure they're in the right seat. And of course, Launcher Brands available. Um, I launched that this year, covers a lot of the aspects that are in this workshop. Um, and there's also a TED Talk. Um, if you Google me on, the, on, on YouTube, just do Ramon Peralta TED Talk. Um, I would love to hear your feedback on that as well. It's geared towards entrepreneurs. And I'm really, really passionate about seeing you all become very, very successful as you launch your brand. So thank you, Bob. I'll yield the rest of the time for Q&A. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, Ramon. We will use the rest of the time up until the top of the hour for questions. Just as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button. If you just hover on the bottom of your screen and type in your question, we'll take as many as we can up until uh, one o'clock. So the, the first one we have um, is from uh, Carmela. Uh, can, you, can you clarify keywords and give uh, some additional examples? Yes, yes. So um, there is a tool. Um, and let me know, Bob, if you'd like me to keep this screen up or-, or um, uh, Actually, maybe put, put your contact information up there, I think, uh, Ramon, and then people okay. want to get to you if they can. Okay. All right. So um, that'll work. I'll, I'll just leave that up for now. Okay. Um, so. So Carmen, great question. Um, there is a free software uh, called Google Trends that you can utilize. Um, all, I think all you need is a Gmail account. Um, it's, it's part of the Google suite of services. Um, you want to see what are people using to find you or find businesses like yours. I don't know what industry you're in, but let's just assume that you're, uh, I don't know, um, a, a leadership coach or a life coach what or a therapist what do you think people are searching on google to find you are they searching for therapy in connecticut or fairfield county counseling or connecticut leadership training right make sure that those keywords right are are are, are now part of the content in your website and in your brand story and hopefully in in your domain for example our domain is PeraltaDesign.com. So if somebody is searching for a design agency in Connecticut, design is a keyword and it's in our URL. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help us rank high. And then we have case studies and testimonials and about us and services and all those opportunities on your website allow you to utilize those keywords over and over. And the more times you use them, right, the more relevant they are when somebody searches. And if somebody is searching and they're using the keyword and you have a lot of them in your website, your website is going to organically or free show up high in the search. And we want to try to get your company to show up on the first page or the second page. And when I say that you can, you can couple that with a paid strategy, what I mean is you can also have a pay-per-click strategy in addition to having good SEO strategy. And now you, it's kind of like a shot in the arm that you're going to appear in search terms. So I hope that helps um, clarify that. If not, I can go in, into it a little bit more. Yeah, the, um, Carmel just um, added that she's in the pet boarding and daycare grooming um, yes. business. So I think you know those kinds of keywords with you know pet boarding and day, uh, yes. pet care and things like that would be the types of examples we're most talking about. Exactly, and, and Bob, I will add that in Fairfield County uh, or Connecticut, pet boarding and pet grooming, it's a very, very competitive space. There are a lot of them. So you're, you're gonna want to incorporate uh, a paid strategy so that you have, you give yourself somewhat of an advantage and not rely solely on organic search. And I, I'll say this uh, last about websites. If you're small and you think you, you know, because you're small and you don't have a big budget, you're going to just do a one page website or some of you don't even have websites, but it's not, it's going to be ignored by this, by the search engines and people aren't going to find you again. You need to have at least 300 words per page. And I would say a three to five page website is, is more recommended um, to be relevant than one that's just one page. And I understand we all got to start somewhere, 
But I'm just saying the more pages you have, the more content you have, the more keywords you use, the more relevant you are to the search engines. And you're going to rank higher when somebody's looking for your service. Okay, that's a, a good uh, good advice there. Um, here's here's one uh, from Philip. Um, how do the steps translate into the nonprofit world? I'm yes. actually, um, so if you could talk about a little yes. bit about Yes, that's an excellent question because we have, um, a, 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 I would say, almost half of our clientele are nonprofits. We work with a lot of nonprofits. United Way of New York City is one of them, in fact. Um, and I sit on a number of boards. And you have to run a nonprofit like a for-profit. Uh, what I mean is you, you still have to identify who's your target. Who's your target donor? Or who's your target volunteer? Or who's your target funder? What the, what's the avatar of that person? And where do they spend their time? Um, very much like that, you have to also understand that you're competing against other nonprofits for that same donor dollar. So what makes your nonprofit stand out amongst them? So I think all of the steps translate to a nonprofit if you look at your target customer as being your donor or your funder and take that same approach. What matters to them? What makes your charity different? Um, you saw with Choose Love, she had a very compelling backstory. Um, so what's your backstory? What's the why behind your nonprofit? And if you're a smaller nonprofit, you may be able to leverage some brand equity off partnering with some bigger nonprofits. You know, co-sponsor a 5K with another nonprofit or hold a symposium with a nonprofit that maybe complements your service offerings, but is a more recognizable brand. Let's say, don't know what yours is, but let's say yours uh, aligns with United Way or with Boys and Girls Club. There are, there are donors and customers and clients that are and funders that already trust those bigger brands, but when they see your brand alongside of it, it's going to rub off on yours. And all of a sudden they're like, well, this nonprofit might be okay. And I think I'm going to support them as well. So tell your story, differentiate, and align with other nonprofits, but definitely want to market yourself as if you were a for-profit. Uh, excellent. Uh, here, here's um, one from, uh, from Hector. Um, he has a company that provides landscape and handyman services for homeowner associations and apartment mm -hmm. complexes. And he's asking, how can I create a logo or icon that communicates to my audience that my company provides landscape and handyman services to HOAs. Yeah, that's, a, that's great. You know, what I love about that, Hector, is that you have a, you have a particular niche. So you're already on your way to being successful because you can really focus all of your branding to HOAs and you can build a database for HOAs and, and HOAs are going to be more multi-unit projects versus singular projects. So, you know, instead of doing a singular house, for example, you might illustrate in a way that it's a community of houses. Maybe it's the typical handyman logo is like a house with a roof uh, or, 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 a, uh, or a single tree for a landscaper um, or a combination of the tree and house to show that they do residential. So because you're going after HOAs and you're going after commercial projects or multi-unit projects, I would tell your logo designer to focus on conveying in, a, in, an icon, in an icon this idea of stacking or multiple or many. Um, so maybe it's, it's, um, it's a, let's just say a roof that gets repeated, but the roof keeps getting smaller as it goes back, or maybe they're, they're, um, they're stacked. So you see one in the middle and two in the back, and then maybe one in the distance. So maybe you use perspective or scale to imply that you're doing multiple homes. Um, but without getting too overly complicated, remember, simple is better. Uh, there's a follow-up one uh, Hector has. Do you think a landing page is an effective way to start my small business uh, presence on the website? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, what, and, and that's another excellent point is that um, a great way to build relevancy and test your digital strategy is to create a landing page for each one of your service verticals. So if you're doing electrical work, you're doing landscaping, you're doing painting, you're doing plumbing, 
right? Let's just say, let's just stick with those four. Instead of having your, you know, it's solely fine to find your homepage, you list all four of those and maybe there are four buttons. But every time somebody clicks one of those buttons, it should go to a dedicated landing page for just electri electrical work, for just plumbing, for just landscaping, for just roofing. And what, why is that important is that you can create a digital strategy if it, during a certain time of year, you're slower in one service offering or another, you can create a campaign. Let's say you did a Facebook campaign or a LinkedIn campaign for just the roofing or just the plumbing. You could actually tell by looking at Google Analytics how successful that campaign was by how much traffic you got to that one landing page so that these campaigns would actually skip your homepage and just take the, the person right to that landing page. So we often employ landing page strategy uh, for customers that already have a website because it's a great way to tell where are they going and is this campaign taking uh, a, a user or a customer directly to where I want them to go. So great question and I love use, utilizing landing pages. Yeah. Uh, we, we have time for one or two more if, uh, if people want to ask uh, one or two quick ones. Um, maybe while we're waiting, uh, Ramon, you talked a little bit about email marketing and using yes. a magnet to get email addresses. Yes. Um, do, do you, this is one that uh, at SCORE we encountered a lot of um, small businesses uh, are trying to uh, do that. Do you, are there other ways in addition to the magnet and collecting that that, um, that yeah. you could suggest for uh, gathering email addresses for email campaigns? Yes. I mean, I, I think that the the classic way is, you know, you go to a trade show and, and uh, you know, you have a, a, a bowl or a bucket and, and you offer some sort of a, a raffle and you collect email addresses. You're collecting business cards. It's just the old school way, because you got to go back after that show and manually enter those business business card addresses into MailChimp or Constant Contact. But in both ways, the old school way or the new way with a lead magnet, what's happening here is that people are giving you permission to market to them. That's really the most important aspect of this, because there are still a few companies, they're dinosaurs, but there are a few companies that will sell you an email list. And in the old days, you would buy an email list from them. The problem is that a lot of those people on that email list aren't even alive or they're, you know, they're dead. You know, I mean, dead meaning that it doesn't go anywhere, meaning that they that email is inactive. And so you get a lot of duds. Right. So and not to mention the fact that those people did not volunteer to be marketed to. So they're not going to be happy when they get something from you. It's going to be cold. They're going to unsubscribe. But if you organically build your list through a lead magnet, magnet or through people that, that come into your place of business or through your customers, you know, make sure you have on your, on your invoices a place for them to enter their email address. So off, it's, it's, I forgot what the statistics is, but let's just say it's 10 times more expensive to hunt after a new client than it is to market to a happy client. And oftentimes as business owners, we get so focused, I'm guilty of it too, that I'm more interested in hunting for new ones rather than cultivating and harvesting from people that are, have already worked with me and are happy with me. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer, Bob, that um, you'll be more successful if you nurture a list of people that have given you permission by engaging with you, by downloading something from you, by purchasing from you, than from marketing to somebody that has never heard from you before. Yeah, 100% agree. That's a sound, sound advice. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for uh, for questions. Uh, Ramon, if I can actually just advance the slide. As, as yes. a reminder, um, the webinar was recorded and the materials will be available on our website within the next day or so. Our um, next workshop is going to be an in-person workshop at the Norwalk Library on Wednesday, November 30th at 6 p.m. And that topic is access to capital with a panel of experts covering a range of capital sources that are available to small business. Again, you can read more about that on our website. Again, if you would like to take advantage of uh, free counseling, you can use the yellow bit.ly link that we put up earlier, or you can go to our website and uh, click on request a mentor. And if I could uh, please ask you to fill out your valuations. They're very helpful as we, uh, as we go forward. I'd like to thank, uh, 
the Monroe Chamber of Commerce and Edith Wheeler Memorial Library for their help in planning um, this webinar with SCORE. And on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's uh, live webinar. And in particular, a big thank you to Ramon for presenting today. And enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and have a great Thanksgiving holiday. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.